Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we're going to discuss optical modes, specifically in the context of multimode fibers and single mode fibers. So let's get started. First, we should discuss why the often presented ray picture of the propagation of light inside of waveguides is incorrect. If you Google the word multimode fiber, you'd like to see diagrams similar to these ones here, where it's indicated that the propagation of light through a medium progresses like a bunch of arrows bouncing around inside of it. In the case of a single mode fiber, it's sometimes indicated that we have an arrow going sort of straight through, but for multimode fibers, it sort of bounces around multiple times. Now, there's a number of issues with this picture. Uh, first, a theoretical one, which is that if we have just one of these rays propagating straight through a single mode fiber, then we can sort of get bouncy behavior to just altering the input angle a little bit and even get multiple bounces like so, or if we just have a sufficiently long fiber, right, bending it, bending it slightly. So that seems to be maybe a um, kind of theoretical objection to this picture. But you can say, okay, maybe that's just a theoretical concern, but there also are, let's say, some experimental problems. For example, if we send light from a multimode fiber into a single mode fiber, then if the ray picture is correct, we'd expect quite high attenuation because it's a little bit like taking a large bucket of water and trying to pour that into a garden hose. Of course, we'd expect to miss because the diameter mismatch between these two uh, receptacles. And of course, we see the same thing for the um, case of optical fibers if we try this experiment. But what if we go the other way around? What if we send light from a single mode fiber into a multimode fiber? Well, if the ray picture is correct, we'd expect very low loss in this case because there's almost no way that a uh, line going straight from the sort of narrow core right here into the big one could possibly miss this. Like, where else could the light possibly go? Uh, but what we actually see is very high loss in this case, which again is surprising because it's a bit like pouring water from a garden hose into a very large bucket and so I'm missing with a large portion of it. So how does that actually make any sense if the ray picture is correct? So to understand what's going on here, we first have to remind ourselves how light truly propagates. And to do this, I'd like to use Huygens' principle, which I think might be the most underrated principle in physics. Um, I also like to call this the antenna principle because I think it gets more of a, um, let's say, a microscopic picture of what's actually going on as the light propagates forwards. The basic idea of Huygens' principle is that when you see a wavefront, then essentially it's in the process of exciting a very large number of very small antennas present everywhere on the wavefront. And the next wavefront you'll see in the next time step is going to be a linear combination of all of these different waves that have been emitted uh, based on the amplitude and phase of all of the uh, excited antennas here. Then that wavefront is going to excite a new set of antennas based on the wavefront's phase and amplitude and so on and so forth. That's how the field sort of propagates forwards. In the case of the uh, fiber, for example, we can imagine like a cross-section here, where the entire cross-section consists of a very large number of in infinitesimally small antennas. It gets excited by some input field with a certain phase and amplitude distribution. And the next field, the next step is going to be determined by these excitations, and so on and so forth. Now, as you can imagine, if you just choose some random field distribution, most likely the field in any one step will not have any relationship to the uh, next field in the next step, or at least not a very trivial one. Um, because there's so many ways that these antennas and their emissions can interfere with each other. But there might be certain uh, distributions of the electric field with the special property that whatever uh, excitation pattern you get in one segment will be identical to the excitation pattern of the next one, causing the field to retain its shape as we propagate through the, the waveguide. And it's such an electric field distribution that we refer to as a mode. So essentially, a mode is just a field distribution with a, let's say, constant time average optical power as we move through the, uh, the waveguide. In order to find one of these modes, we have to determine an electric field with both an x, y, and z component that solves the Helmholtz equation for the given uh, waveguide geometry we're interested in. So that could, for example, be a, um, an optical fiber that's cylindrical, so we'd use cylindrical coordinates. It could be like a slab waveguide, so we'd use Cartesian coordinates. It could be some other configuration, for example, a more like hexagonal structure, which would be relevant for photonic crystal fibers. But basically, we have to solve this Helmholtz equation that looks a little bit like a um, simple harmonic oscillator equation because we get the second derivative of something here that's equal to negative constant times the thing itself. So kind of an interesting thing to, to keep in mind. Now, um, I'm going to go through the details of mathematically determining the electric field distribution for the for the Wilson mode of a single mode fiber just a bit, but I want to make completely sure that we understand the intuition behind Huygens' principle and how it gives rise to modes, how it gives rise to single mode fibers and multimode fibers. So, what is the intuition for single mode fibers? Well, let's consider a single mode fiber here with a very narrow core, and then assume that we've excited this, um, these antennas inside the cross section with a field that has uh, the same phase all the way throughout, but maybe a sort of varying um, electric field distribution with a certain curvature. 
Okay, so again, I've only drawn two antennas in this case, but you have to imagine that we have a complete continuum of antennas as we go throughout this cross section here. Okay, so the point is that the optical path lengths are just so that we get construct interference in the center and only in the center for this case. And if we choose this envelope here, um, which antennas get excited the most correctly, then we can actually produce the same excitation pattern in the next segment and so on and so forth as the uh, wave moves forward. So we can construct interference only in the center. But what if we tried to use a different field pattern? For example, one where the uh, phase changes continuously from 0 to 180 degrees as we move uh, through the fiber here. Well, if that's the case, then we get construct interference inside of the middle of the fiber, but also construct interference outside inside of the cladding. So that's not very good because now if we go to the next step, so to speak, then the excitation pattern here will be so that the wave sort of will begin to propagate away from the core into the plastic jacket surrounding the cladding where the attenuation is quite high. So eventually we simply lose all of the available power and we uh, don't get a mode that propagates. So in some way you can think about a single mode fiber as a, like a bad mode remover. For example, in this diagram here that I borrowed from RP Photonics, um, light is being launched into a single mode fiber at a slight misalignment with the, the core. So it means that we both excite the fundamental mode, but also some high order mode. I think it's going to be a cladding mode in this case that extends very far beyond the, the core. And you can see as we move forward, the cladding mode basically decays and becomes uh, negligible. It sort of has a lot of loss, but in the end we get uh, just a pure single mode fiber behavior coming out without any sort of speckling pattern that would be emitted right here. Okay, and again, the same intuition applies for multi-mode fibers because in, we can still get the fundamental mode here where we have let's say a um, constant phase profile and we get construct interference in the center, but we can also support one where the phase changes as we go throughout the cross section here, because now we can get both construct interference up here and down here while still being inside of the, the core. And again, if we choose the exact amplitude distribution correctly, we can uh, reproduce this field pattern in every single segment of the, the fiber. Now I've only showed really cartoonish pictures of this, but of course you, know, you can get very many different types of modes depending on the exact fiber geometry and the refractive index profile. Um, so that's something you can either do analytically or numerically depending on the exact situation. So with this in mind, we can also explain why we got so much loss when sending light from a single mode fiber into a multi-mode fiber, even though the ray picture would suggest otherwise. The basic explanation is that the uh, single mode fiber field pattern that goes into the multi-mode fiber doesn't actually match any of the modes allowed by the multi-mode fiber. So it has to be described as a linear combination of modes inside the multi-mode fiber. And some of these high order modes will be cladding modes that extend into the plastic jacket up here where the attenuation is quite high. So as we propagate this single mode field forward inside of the multi-mode fiber, some of these high order fields will be attenuated quite dramatically. And then that's why we get the power loss that the ray picture cannot really explain. All right, so I hope that sort of clears up the, uh, let's say the intuition behind single mode fibers and multi mode fibers. So let's actually see how we can uh, go through the process of determining what these modes look like mathematically. Now, the exact procedure is a bit too long for this video. So I've um, created a note that should be available in the description where I go through all of the gory mathematical details. So please check that out if you want to see the, the full story. But the basic rundown here is that we need the electric field components of both the X and the Y and Z components, and also the same for the magnetic field, which solve the Helmholtz equation. So our strategy is first to write the electric field in polar coordinates because we have a cylindrical fiber. So we have a radial component, a, uh, an angular component, and a set component like so. Then we plug this into the uh, Helmholtz equation. Then we get a differential equation for each one of these components, E rho, E phi, and E set. And uh, it turns out that the easiest way to proceed is to uh, solve the set component first because it's the simplest one. So we assume that it can be uh, solved with separation of variables. And that gives us the fact that the angular part is simply a, a complex exponential with m being an integer. Again, that simply arises because the if we go around by 2 pi, we should get the same result coming out. And we get a set part that also looks like a complex exponential with a value of beta here that can take on a number of different values. And we care a lot about this beta value here because it's essentially the spatial frequency as we move along the set direction of the, the fiber. And again, we care about that because if light is present in a certain mode, it's going to have a certain beta value. And the derivative of that beta value with respect to the uh, optical frequency is going to give us the group velocity, the speed at which the pulse propagates down the length of the fibers. This is a pretty important parameter to determine. And only certain values are actually allowed if the, we want a solution to this um, to Helmholtz equation up here. So what we can do is, uh, for the radial part of the field, is to notice that it, um, 
has to satisfy a Bessel equation like so. So inside of the call we get a uh, sort of regular Bessel function of uh, the first kind, which oscillates like so inside of the call, uh, depending on the value of p we have. Uh, while outside the call we get a, let's see, it's called a uh, modified Bessel function of the second kind, I believe. That sort of decays exponentially with this q parameter here being the decay rate. And notice that it depends on the value of the propagation constant as we move forward in the set direction. We can also note that if we um, multiply by r and square, and then add the results together, we get a parameter called v, or v squared rather, which is independent of the mode. So this expression does not depend on beta. It only depends on the design of the fiber through r and the uh, core cladding, refractive index difference, as well as the wavelength of the light that we're launching in. But the point is that um, if we have a mode with a certain beta value, then it can only oscillate so fast inside of the core and have such a such and such a decay rate outside in the cladding. It's a, these are sort of locked together by the design of the fiber. That's quite convenient because that allows us to eliminate other p and q in subsequent calculations. So are we done already? Can we just say that this is the radial distribution of the, the field that we finished? Well, not quite, because we need to ensure that the electric field inside the core and the cladding have the same value exactly at the core cladding interface, but also identical derivatives at this interface. And the same must be true for the H field, and the components have to be related using these two Maxwell's equations. So uh, again, going through a lot of mathematical details here, you can see all of them in the note in the description. We find that we need to determine a value of beta, which satisfies this equation right here. And remember that there's a beta hiding inside every single instance of P and Q in this formula. So that looks pretty complicated. But luckily, we can use an approximation, namely that the index in the core the cladding is almost the same. We call it slightly bigger, but it's only about like maybe 0.1% or something. And that also means that beta and this uh, uh, propagation constant multiplied by the, um, the index in the cladding will just be equal to 1. So with that in mind, we can reduce this whole expression to the following. Now note that actually gives us two options for equations that can provide us with both, depending on whether we choose a plus or minus when we take the, um, the square root right here. And so if you exploit some of the properties of Bessel functions, you can change it into these two equations here for the minus and plus cases respect respectively. So let's actually try and solve these equations. Here I'm just going to do it graphically. So I've uh, chosen a value of v of 4.5. And we can see we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven solutions, right? So um, note, by the way, that there's numerous different ways to classify and categorize these um, different modes, some classified by which ones have linear polarization and um, using different indices and such. Don't worry too much about that now. Just be aware that some authors use different conventions here. Uh, also note that here we have a mode that's like almost ready to arise, but not quite. It doesn't quite constitute the solution yet. So if we increase the v value a little bit further, uh, we actually get nine solutions. So we get the same seven as before, but we also get number eight right here that's now present, and also a number nine down here. Okay, but a natural question to ask is, under what circumstances do we have one and only one mode propagating inside of the, the waveguide? Well, it turns out that if you pick a value of v that's greater than 2.4, you get multiple modes present, but if you pick one that's below, for example, 2.39, we're going to get a single one that's located right here. Now, um, it's important to keep in mind that there's really no such thing as a single mode fiber. It's more correct to see that um, a fiber can have single mode behavior for a certain wavelength. For example, um, usually telecom fiber is uh, designed to have single mode behavior near 1550 nanometers. But if you choose a lower wavelength, for example, I think it's around 1000 nanometers, then you get multiple behavior out of it. So just be aware when uh, people talk about single mode fibers, it depends on which wavelength you're talking about. But um, how does this fundamental mode with a single solution actually look? If you go through, again, even more math details, you'll find that the field inside of the core will look like the equation on top here, and the field outside will look like the equation down here. Um, so one small detail here is that technically there is also a set component of these two fields, but in magnitude it's much smaller than the x and y components that we can just neglect it. Note also that the um, polarization in any case only depends on the set coordinates, so how far along the axis we are, but it doesn't depend on the, let's say, the radial distance away from the core or the angular coordinate like so. So in other words, if you have a single polarization at one location inside of this uh, fundamental mode, it's going to be the same all the way throughout the, the whole cross-section, which is kind of convenient. Note also that this particular mode that we've determined here as um, describing the fundamental mode corresponds to a polarization that has, let's say, it's clockwise spatial rotation at a given instant. So if you sort of freeze time and move through the fiber and look at the orientation of the electric field, you'll find that it sort of spirals around in a clockwise direction. But if you then think about how that looks from a, let's say, a single cross-sectional point here over time, 
you find that corresponds to counterclockwise temporal rotation of the electric field vector. Might be a bit hard to imagine, but it's actually quite possible. So the point is that it corresponds to right-hand circular light. But of course, since the fiber is cylindrically symmetrical, then uh, if right-hand circular light is possible, the left-hand circular light is also a possible mode of propagation inside of the, the fiber. And again, if these two polarizations are okay, then any linear combination of them must also be okay. So that's why we get both linear and also any kind of elliptical light you might be interested in being a supported mode for single mode propagation. So it's kind of nice to know that a single mode fiber has the, uh, the nice behavior that all of the polarizations we used to from free space optics, linear, circular, elliptical, or whatever, are also supported by the, um, by the single mode fiber, at least in the absence of birefringes or anything, anything else like that. Okay, but of course you can also plot the actual electric field distributions using the expression for the uh, Bessel functions. So here we see the E field distribution, um, both inside and outside the, uh, the core. You can see that they actually match up perfectly here with the same value and same derivative as, as expected. Um, and if we take the absolute square of that, we get the distribution over here to the right, which is just the uh, power of the field. Now again, working with a piecewise continuous set of Bessel functions is a bit uh, inconvenient maybe. So we can actually approximate this with a Gaussian with a certain width that depends on the, the V parameter. So again, not quite a Gaussian, but it's actually quite close as you can see from the diagram. All right, so that actually brings us to the end of this video. So just a quick summary of what we've learned so far. Uh, we've learned that the ray picture of the propagation of light inside of fibers is not correct. It's only an approximation to the true underlying uh, sort of field picture. Um, we found that the Huygens principle, or the antenna principle, as I like to call it, is a really good, um, there's an intuitive tool for understanding why it is that multi-mode fibers and single-mode fibers arise. It's simply because of constructive and destructive interference occurring at the correct, correct places. Now, this picture is also kind of interesting or useful for describing other kinds of waves, for example, sound waves, uh, water waves, uh, could even be, let's say, uh, electric magnetic uh, field waves inside of, uh, in the case of radio or for the case of like free space lasers, which you might be familiar with in terms of the Hermit Gaussian and Laguerre Gaussian modes like so. Um, finally, I think it's also kind of interesting to translate this Huygens principle and turn a picture to the case of quantum mechanics, where, uh, well, in the case we just saw here, we're looking for, let's say, waves that have a certain spatial frequency that sort of tell us how a set of antennas will sort of propagate a field forwards in, in space. But in the case of maybe the Schrodinger equation, um, we're essentially trying to find the energy, which is sort of the number that tells us how the field is going to propagate through through time. And I think there's a bit of a connection maybe with um, what's called Feynman's picture of quantum mechanics, where we sort of sum over all the possible uh, paths that a field can take from one location to another one or to find the total probability. Again, maybe a bit beyond my pay grade and beyond the scope of this video, but I think it's an interesting, um, I guess, idea to, to keep in mind for the future. So anyway, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.